Good evening. Please leave the light on. Tonight, we hold vigil with Fritz Lieber, actor, fantasy writer, and ask the question, how could a creature of the night survive the glare of the 20th century media world? When he wrote his 1940 story, The Girl with the Hungry Eyes, Fritz Lieber seems to have discovered an uncomfortable answer. I'll tell you why the girl gives me the creeps. Why I hate to look at magazines anymore because I know she'll turn up somewhere in a brassiere or a bubble bath. Why I don't like to think of millions of Americans drinking in that poisonous half-smile. But you see, I'm not altogether sure myself what I'm hinting at, beyond a certain point. There are vampires and vampires, and not all of them suck blood. And there were the murders, if they were murders. Besides, let me ask you this. Why, when America is obsessed with the girl, don't we find out more about her? Why hasn't there been a feature in life for The Post, a profile in The New Yorker? I'll tell you why. It's because from the top to the bottom of the whole world of advertising, there isn't a solitary soul who knows where the girl came from, where she lives, what she does, who she is, even what her name is. What's more, not a single solitary soul ever sees her. Except one poor damned photographer who's making more money off her than he ever hoped to in his life and who's scared and miserable as hell every minute of the day. Oh, I'm off my rocker, am I? People can't keep out of sight that way. Well, I happen to know they can. Because last year, I was that poor, damned photographer. Even the girl had to start small. Picture me in 1947. I had a fourth-floor studio in that rat hole the Hauser building. Business was lousy. It was one of those dark, gray afternoons. I just finished developing some picks I was doing on speculation for Lovely Belt Girdles and Buford's Pool and Playground, the last a faked-up beach scene. I was about to call it a day. And then she came in. She was wearing a cheap, shiny black dress. Her arms are pretty skinny, you know, or can you see things like that anymore? And then the thin neck. The slightly gaunt, almost prim face, the tumbling mass of dark hair, and looking out from under it, the hungriest eyes in the world. I remember that I took a backward step and that my hand jerked so that the photos I was looking at sailed to the floor. There was the faintest dizzy feeling like something was being drawn out of me. That was all. Then she opened her mouth, and everything was back to normal for a while. I see you're a photographer, mister, she said. Could you use a model? I doubt it, I told her. What have you done? Well, she gave me a vague sort of story, and I got the idea she was feeling her way. And you think anyone can model? Sure, she said. I think I could do it. I should have kicked her out right then. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot, I told her. I'm going to try a couple of shots of you. Understand it's strictly on spec. She gave me a smile. The first. That's swell by me, she said. I took three or four shots. I think the uneasiness was in me all the while. I tossed her a card and pencil. Write your name and address and phone, and made for the dark room. A little later, she walked out. I didn't call any goodbyes. Next morning, I made the rounds. My first step was Munch's Brewery. Papa Munch wiped his fat hands on the big apron he was wearing and grabbed my thin stack of picks. He was about halfway through when he came to her. That's it, he said. The photography's not so hot, but that's the girl. I wonder now why Papa Munch sensed what the girl had right away, while I didn't. I think it was because I saw her first in the flesh, if that's the right word. Who is she? he asked. One of my new models, I tried to make it casual. Bring her out tomorrow morning, he told me. We'll photograph her here. Hey, don't look so sick, he added. Have some beer. While I went away telling myself it was just a fluke. Just the same, when I reverently laid my next stack of pics on Mr. Fitch of Lovely Belt's rose-colored blotter, I had hers on top. Mr. Fitch leaned back and said, Hmm, what do you think, Miss Willow? He couldn't hide the fact that he was hooked. 
I hot-footed it back to the office and grabbed up the card I'd given her to put down her name and address. It was blank. I don't mind telling you that the next five days were about the worst I ever went through in an ordinary way. I had to start stalling. Papa Munch got suspicious. You really got this girl? Of course I have. Well, look, you get her here tomorrow morning, you hear? I went around to all the model and employment agencies. I used up some of my last dimes putting advertisements in the papers. I roamed the streets. The fifth afternoon, I knew I was licked. Papa Munch's deadline was due to run out at six o'clock. Mr. Fitch had already canceled. I was at the studio window, looking out at Ardley Park. She walked in. I'd gone over this moment so often in my mind that I had no trouble putting on my act. Hello, I said, hardly looking at her. Hello, she said. I said curtly, Look here, I'm going to give you a chance. There's a client of mine looking for a girl, your general type. I picked up my stuff. Come on. Uh-uh, she said, not moving. What do you mean? I said. I'm not going to see any client of yours. The hell you aren't, I said. She shook her head slowly. You're not fooling me, baby. They want me. And now I'll tell you how we're going to work. You aren't going to have my name or address or phone number. Nobody is. And we're going to do all the pictures right here. Just you and me. In the end, all I could do was phone Papa Munch and tell him her conditions. He said no several times and hung up. It didn't face her. About midnight, Papa Munch called me up. I don't know what insane asylum you're renting this girl from, but I'll take her. Even Mr. Fitch reconsidered, and after taking two days to tell me it was quite impossible, he accepted the conditions too. Next morning we went to work. When we finished, I found out there were still more rules. I started down with her to get a sandwich and coffee. Uh-uh, she said. I'm going down alone. And look, baby, if you ever try to follow me, if you ever so much as stick your head out that window when I go, you can hire yourself another model. You can imagine how all this crazy stuff strained my temper and my imagination. I remember trying to figure out what could be back of it, whether she was hiding from the police or maybe had got the idea it was smart to be temperamental or, more likely, Papa Munch was right and she was partly nuts but I had my picks to finish up. Looking back, it's amazing to think how fast her magic began to take hold of the city after that. The rest of my story will help show you why I'm frightened in a general way, but I have a theory too. I'll give it to you in a few words. Imagine her knowing the hiddenmost hungers of millions of men. Imagine her seeing deeper into those hungers than the people that had them seeing the hatred and the wish for death behind the lust. Imagine her shaping herself in that complete image, keeping herself as aloof as marble, yet imagine the hunger she might feel in answer to their hunger. Eventually, I made my pass. She lifted my hand off her as if it were a damp rag. Nix, baby, she said, this is working time. But afterward, I pressed, the rules still hold. She never budged an inch. Of course, I wouldn't have been human if I hadn't made more passes, but they always got the wet rag treatment, and there weren't any more smiles. I changed. I went sort of crazy and lightheaded, only sometimes I felt my head was going to burst. And I started to talk to her all the time, about myself. It seemed natural. It didn't matter what I was doing. Lighting her, posing her, fussing with props. I kept up a steady gab. I told her everything I knew about myself. I told her about my first girl. I told her about my brother Bob's bicycle. I told her about running away on a freight and the licking Pa gave me when I came home. I told her about shipping to South America and the blue sky at night. I told her about Betty. I told her about my mother dying of cancer. I told her about the first picture I ever sold. I told her how Chicago looked from a sailboat. I told her how I felt now. She never paid the slightest attention to what I said. I couldn't even tell if she heard me. It was when we were getting our first nibble from national advertisers that I decided to follow her when she went home. Wait, I can place it better than that. Something you'll remember from the out-of-town papers. Those maybe murders I mentioned. I think there were six. The police could never be sure they weren't heart attacks, and afterward there was a feeling that they hadn't really stopped 
but were being continued in a less suspicious way. That's one of the things that scares me now. But at that time, my only feeling was relief that I'd decided to follow her. I made her work until dark one afternoon. I waited until the street door slammed, then I ran down. I'd slipped on a dark coat she'd never seen me in, and a dark hat. She was walking by Ardley Park toward the heart of town. It was one of those warm fall nights. My idea for tonight was just to find out where she lived. She picked a spot under a street lamp opposite one of the Munch Girl billboards. Now it frightens me to think of her lurking that way. A convertible slowed down going past her, backed up, swung into the curb. I got a good look at the fellow's face. He was about my age. Next morning, the same face looked up at me from the front page of the paper. As in the other maybe murders, the cause of death was uncertain. All kinds of thoughts were spinning in my head that day, but there were only two things I knew for sure that I got the first real offer from a national advertiser and that I was going to take the girl's arm and walk down the stairs with her when we quit work. She didn't seem surprised. You know what you're doing. I know. She smiled. I was wondering when you'd get around to it. We cut across into Ardley Park. She didn't say anything, and she didn't look at me. But I could see her lips twitching, and after a while her hand tightened on my arm. We stopped. She dropped down and pulled me after her. I was looking down at her face. I was fumbling with her blouse. She took my hand away, not like she had in the studio. I don't want that, she said. First, I'll tell you what I did afterward. Then I'll tell you what she said. What I did was run away. I don't remember all of that because I was dizzy and the pink sky was swinging against the dark trees. But after a while, I staggered into the lights of the street. The next day... I closed up the studio. I never saw the girl again in the flesh. I did it because I didn't want to die. She's the smile that tricks you into throwing away your money and your life. She's the eyes that lead you on and on and then show you death. When you yearn toward her face on the billboards, remember that. And this is what she said. I want you. I want everything that's made you happy and everything that's hurt you bad. I want your first girl. I want that shiny bicycle. I want that licking. I want that pinhole camera. I want Betty's legs. I want the blue sky filled with stars. I want your mother's death. I want your blood on the cobblestones. I want the first picture you sold. I want the lights of Chicago. I want your wanting me. I want your life. Feed me, baby. Feed me. These creatures are undeterred by time and space. Tomorrow night, Mrs. Edith Wharton demonstrates. It would seem there is no escaping them. Sleep well, if you can. David Tennant was the reader, and the stories are abridged by Robin Brooks. It was produced by Clive Brill and as a Pacificus production for BBC Radio 4. Radio 4.